Welcome back to the manor, Julian McBain here, and we are still doing migration. And uh, I'm still doing migration because I'm having a great time. And I've been in this friggin' desert like the whole time. Um, but no, I've been enjoying it. I've had probably the most fortuitous migration I have had in my life. And so that's good, you know. Certainly can't argue about that. Um, you know, I started not 10 seconds ago. I didn't know what this video was going to be about, but I wanted to kind of explore a notion that I've been having. Uh, but before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome to the manor. Please take a moment and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time. So make sure you subscribe. Okay, so... It, it occurred to me that as I as I finish it up, so I've been watching Jordan Peterson's Bible lecture series, and I'm not going to get into uh, like the the Bible-y stuff too much, um, because I know that's not why you come to my channel. But or or maybe maybe that's something you'd all be interested in. You can feel free to comment below and stuff like that. But I don't think that theology is really my it's not really my niche. Uh, at least not on YouTube, and but philosophy is, and there's a lot of philosophy that comes out of organized religion, and that's you know I have not only copies of the Bible, but I've got a Koran, and I've got the Book of Mormon. No, I'm I'm neither Muslim nor am I a Mormon, but there's still wisdom in these books, and so there's wisdom in the stories, and so what I what I found interesting about uh, Peterson's Bible lecture series is the fact that they're based on the the psychological basis of the stories or implications of the stories. I'm like, okay, well, that would be an interesting an interesting thing to listen to. And it takes them a whole lecture, a two-whole-hour lecture, to even make it to the first line in the book, right? Because you, you, know, you obviously have to lay that much groundwork for such an undertaking as that. And, and at first, I thought it was kind of funny, but looking back on the first lecture, as I am on the last lecture, and each lecture, it's two hours of lecture plus half an hour of question and answer session in every episode. I don't listen to the questions and answers because although I'm sure there is a lot to be gained from them, I was more interested in the actual lecture material. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm listening to these, and it's the, it's the psychological significance of archetypal stories because that's what they are. Um, and I didn't realize just how much those stories pervade our culture inside and out and how they've built upon it. And, I, and I'm serious about that. So like, uh, you've got Jonah and the whale is Pinocchio. Like it's that simple. Pinocchio goes into Monstro to rescue Geppetto. Well, that's Jonah and the whale. And I know Jonah and the whale is not in, uh, Genesis, which is the only book that Peterson covers in this lecture series, but it's still that is a an archetypal story that can be retold in a hundred different ways, and we'll understand the notion because the the basis of the story is something we feel deep down. And so there's, as I've been listening to this, and I, and I hear there's a lot of repetition in the way that these stories portray themselves, and and it occurred to me that. Every story, every story that I can think of that sticks in my mind has some sort of literary equivalence in about every sacred book I've ever laid hands on that involves storytelling. I mean, there are stories that that are the same in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And, and, I've, and I've read the Epic of Gilgamesh, not the whole thing, but a good chunk of it. Um, and the same basic stories arise. Uh, as an example, um, you've got a flood story. You've got Noah, right? And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, there is actually a flood story. And it's, it's along of much the same roots. I think that the, the moral framework behind why the flood happened um, was not exactly the same. But basically, it's everyone sucks, and so all of a sudden there's a flood to destroy everything because, you know, everyone sucks. But someone survives. And um, I'm pretty sure there's a similar story in several Native American cultures. Global! 65 pet. Thank you, Mindark! Um, 
because I seem to remember a story about a giant canoe. I don't think they took all the animals with them, but it was it was on a similar dint. And I'd have to look that up. I don't remember which Indian culture had that one, but um, I, I vaguely recall that being told when I was in, in grade school. But the fact that these stories exist and they're pervasive throughout and um, certain things in there that that really trigger things and it's it never really occurred to me why and the one i think i like the best is the fact that he really expounds on snakes right people are afraid of snakes doesn't matter if the snake is too small it doesn't matter you know no, they're afraid of snakes and it it always kind of boggled me why would you be afraid of a snake you know i mean okay if a giant ass um anaconda rolls up on you or a boa constrictor but even then people like to mess around with boa constrictors and boa constrictors aren't generally all that hostile to human life they can't eat us anyway they wouldn't know what to do with us even if they did manage to, to wrap themselves around us um because their their jaw sure as hell can't dislocate that large but but apparently, back when we were an arboreal, an arboreal pre-human species, our primary predator was snakes. And so I found that very interesting. I'm like, oh, I never would have thought of a snake as a, as a predator to humans, like tigers and lions and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, you know the the, the normal large super or megafauna that you'd expect to to prey on larger fauna, which we were at the time and still technically are today. That all made sense to me with the idea of snakes. But, I mean, we weren't always, ape, you know, mega apes. We were smaller monkeys. And um, we were smaller than chimps. And our, even, like, chimpanzee babies can be picked off by a boa constrictor or an anaconda or any other large constrictive snake. And so we apparently have a, um, a circuit. So your brain is made up of neurons, right? And in those neurons, certain circuits exist physically. They're, they're more neurological than psychological. And a, there's a play circuit. Like, it's so ingrained, there's an actual circuit that, that causes you to play. We fundamentally need play. Even as adults, we need play. Um, which is probably why we enjoy playing with our kids so much, especially when they're young. And so there's a, there's a snake switch a snake circuit which i didn't know about that was a that was that was like incredibly um fascinating to me that we actually have a circuit that warns us of snakes and to think about how how important that was to our evolution is it's just in, in, an incredible thought process because and then it shows up in all our stories as like the evil thing, right? So it's, you know, it's it's the thing that gave Eve the apple, or the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and so that's why humanity fell. But it's also the basilisk from Harry Potter, you know. And and actually, if I, if I remember, you know, most most games they show a basilisk as a lizard with with the eyes that turn you to stone. But in the older stories where a basilisk shows up, it's a snake that turns you to stone. And Medusa with the head of snakes. So basically Medusa is actually a a snake woman because she's a gorgon, right? She has a, the, the tail of a snake, but the human torso with hair that is still further snakes. They're basilisks growing out of her head. And so and so of course this would end up being the one of the big enemies of Greece. You know, and I think it was it Perseus that killed Medusa? Or was that one of the twelve uh, 12 Labors of Heracles. Um, Medusa. Um, trying to figure... Per, it was Perseus. I was right the first time. So Perseus kills Medusa using, a, using his shield to reflect her countenance back on her. And... and in, and the reason that you turn to stone when you look at the, at the Gorgon or you look at the Basilisk is not because you literally turn to stone. It's because you are so afraid you're paralyzed by fear. It's just like you're looking into a headlight. 
And so, and so that's interesting. I'm like, you know, it never occurred to me. Why does fear make you freeze? It's very counterintuitive. Fear should make you want to run. But no, instinctively, fear makes you freeze. And, and it's not just freeze. Your eyes widen, your pupils dilate so you can see in the dark better. And then your adrenaline system starts pumping so that once you identify the threat, And that fight or flight response can take hold, assuming you have the time to do so, because you're going to stand there paralyzed with fear for a, a few seconds while your brain tries to recharge itself, because you're no longer, you're no longer the active, cognitively acting person. You're now basically the most basic of animals, deciding on whether or not you're going to survive as this thing tries to eat you, right? Or or to hurt you. And this the same thing happens when when you're faced with um, a real a real threat, a, a, a life or death threat. And there's there's two ways you can react to it. It's You can immediately react in a way that will get you out of the situation and you can either run or fight or you'll stand there paralyzed trying to decide what to do. And for a lot of people, it is the latter. But interestingly enough, this is the same circuit that gets triggered when you're threatened by another human. Or when you're dealing with a person that that is a is is a threat to your way of life or what you believe should be your way of life and i found that fascinating because in my life there are people that i have fundamental disagreements with and in in so far as we actually largely disagree with each other's life philosophies okay and in my case i don't mind in in it took me actually like really thinking about it really. Cause I'm like, Oh, you know, they can believe whatever they want. You know, it, it's, I disagree with them, but you know, that's, that's their life. That's, that's the way I am. Right. I'm, it's like, you know, you do you and I'll do me and we just leave each other alone. But, but it doesn't quite work like that. Cause we have to interact. I have to interact with these people and they have to interact with me. And so we have to be able to function at least at a, at a functional level and interact with each other. And sometimes negotiate those value systems so that we can accomplish goals. And so, and so that's very interesting. And then, um, and I didn't realize like that I, I, there was a, a thing, an internal um, interchapter discussion about the possibility of combining. And several of these people were very much against combining, and I was one of the people advocating for combining. And there was a big debate about it and I couldn't understand why they were so vehement about the idea of combining. I mean, debate it, go through the pros and cons and why we might like or not like the idea. And, you know, there's, there's, there's the arguments that, you know, two unique ways of doing things. And there's the argument that, you know, more people, you know, more hands makes lighter work for the same amount of volume. You know, and there's the, the geographic issues of the state I live in because Vermont's a geographically um, stupid when it comes to the way our roads. Vermont is the only state you will find where the phrase you can't get there from here. No, I won't say it's the only state. That's 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 bad. That that was wrong. It is the easiest example of a place where you can say you can't get there from here and have it be actually true. So there are two towns about equidistant as the crow flies from where I live. Um, Burlington, which everyone knows, that, that's like that's all of Vermont for some people, right? Burlington is the city, and it's the only real city we have. I and mean, we have Barry and Montpelier, but those are only cities in Vermont, you know. Um, but we we have Burlington, which every most people think is is all of Vermont, and then equidistant and. Um, is, is a is a city called Newport. Uh, it's not Newport. Is it Newport? Derby. Yeah, it is. It is Newport. Okay, I had it right. So you've got you've got Burlington. You've got Newport. As the crow flies, are roughly the same distance from where I am. It takes forty five minutes to get from the town I'm in to to Burlington. It takes an hour and a half to get from the town I'm in to Newport. You can't get there from here. Because you got to go all the way the fuck around some stuff. 
And, and to be fair, Vermont's really a state with two mountain ranges running up and down it. Um, and you've got, you've got western Vermont, which is where Burlington is, and it's in the Champlain Valley up north. And that whole side is basically the Champlain Valley, and that's where most people go. Because that's where the, the academic center of Vermont is, is in the Champlain Valley. Because you've got Middlebury College, which everyone knows about. And you've got um, UVM, which everyone knows about. And uh, you've got Champlain College, which is separate from UVM, but... The, the campuses have pretty much like morphed into each other. So I'm totally expecting UVM to absorb Champlain sometime in the next 10 years or so. Um, and then you've got the center, because you've got a mountain range. Those are the Green Mountains, right? That's half the Green Mountains. And it's, uh, for, it's the, pro the northernmost segment or part of the northernmost segment of Appalachia. So you've got... The Appalachians, and in the Appalachian range, you've got smaller ranges, and the Green Mountains are part of that. And so on one side of the state, on between, separating the west from the center, is the main ridge of the Green Mountains. And in the center, you've got a valley, basically speaking, and that's... There's only three passes through the Green Mountains from west to center, by the way. You've got the North Pass, which goes around through Burlington, and that's that's Interstate 89. And then you've got the South Pass, which, pass, which is Route 100 and U.S. Route 4, which goes through Rutland. And then you've got the way over the mountain, which is route, Vermont Route 17, which if you're on a motorcycle, it's considered a rite of passage. But if you're on a car, it's considered a fucking nightmare. And so on the other side, we've got another, uh, say, chain of mountains, which are also part of the Green Mountains. But the way you have to go around them and the way the towns are out there, it's, it, it's trying to get anywhere out there is just a pain in the ass. So... Um, so anyway, uh, tangents. Um, shit, where was I going with that? Snakes. Oh, okay. So so anyway, the the light hands makes more, makes less work, but the the geographic issues came into play, and the the cultural issues came into play, and we decided not to do that. But in having these debates they were getting really vehement and, and I'm a passionate person, but I try to keep things, you know, kind of on the level. I couldn't understand why they were getting so upset. It's because I was challenging the way they wanted to live. And so it actually triggered the snake circuit because that's how, that's how humans view enemies is we, we literally, they take on the, um, the manifest, the manifested image or the mental image of a snake. And that's why, you know, when someone's being evil, they're a snake in the grass, right? It's like you, you conniving snake in the grass, right? Because it triggers the snake circuit. And I, I was like, holy shit, I was a snake to them. And they were a snake to me. And, and, and after several other days, I, I realized I, that same circuit was being triggered when I dealt with them in me as I was causing in them. Because we viewed ourselves beyond rivalry. And that doesn't mean that we can't get along and, and deal with each other in a very civil manner. That's not the case. But when the debate got engaged with, that was what was happening. And and so what do you do with that? I don't know. I don't know how to really overcome that. I'm not sure there's a way to overcome that because it's it's so fundamentally ingrained in our psyche, right? It's how we have dealt with the world for so long. And, you know, it's it's very interesting that something would be so ingrained that even in the modern time, modern age, where technology is pretty much, technology has just, just exploded over the last 50 years, right? There, we have shit that's more powerful than the shit in Star Trek, okay? That's how far we've come. The computer I am recording this on has a larger, um, has more power than the starship than the Starship Enterprise D was to have in Star Trek: The Next Generation. That's how far we've come, and that's insane. And yet, despite all that, we still have a circuit that says snake. And as soon as the circuit's triggered, we're we're in that combative stance. And 
and extrapolating from that there's there's more things like that in us and it's the play circuit's a big one like i do a lot of sports fighting you all know that i do historical fencing and i've done heavy lists and i've done the i've even tried out the whole um armored combat league level stuff where you use um steel on each other and you're just wailing on each other and having a good time that's actually the play circuit that's being triggered when you do that because yes you get the adrenaline rush and the and you get the whole combative, and it's it's a test of skill. But because you're not actually trying to hurt your opponent, you're just trying to defeat them, it's not the combat circuit, the, the life-or-death circuit that's going off. Your opponent isn't a snake. They're a partner in a game. And so, and so you don't want to hurt your opponent, you because then if you hurt them, they can't play another iteration of the game with you, which makes you better at it. And so that's really cool, too. And I didn't think of it that way, actually, until just now, but... Like, when I'm fencing, and, and, I, and you know, I'm a fighter. Like, I, I can get into the match. I love to do the, to, the, to the fighting. But I've been in cases where it was a snake in front of me. And it's the same skill set. But it's the same skill set that I've, I've learned and iterated hundreds of times through hundreds of, itera hundreds of iterations of the game. When I did martial arts, it was a game. When I did sparring, it's a game. All of these things are games. But the thing is, is the skills learned in the game can translate to something where it's no longer a game and you have a snake in front of you. And and that's really interesting. That that's, that's how we that's how we ingrained the skills we had. Like if you're a, if you're a soldier or you're a police officer or you are a warrior back in in like the Middle Ages, you'd play these iterative games so that when when it came to the life or death situation. You had the skills you needed in order to come out of it alive. So when the snake rose its head, instead of freezing because you're facing the basilisk, you're able to act upon it. And that's really cool. That's the only word I can think of. It. That's really cool. Because that means that there are things in us, there are things ingrained in us that will probably never go away. We'll never evolve out of them. And... Um, you know, it, it's it's just like several of our organs, and like the it's the appendix. I think that was for raw meat. Um, human organ raw meat. It was the appendix. Um. So, and, and they're saying in a few more generations, the appendix will disappear. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Now, it has become fairly inactive, but there, there are plenty of people who still eat raw meat. And... And so, I don't know. May, maybe our bodies have accomplished this in other ways. And I know that there's a... There's an argument about it, and um, we'd have to really do some actual scientific research that I'm completely underqualified to perform. But, like, I'm a person who eats my meat blue rare to rare. Like, for me, rare is on the cooked side. I'll eat it medium if that's what's available, and, and if it's offered to me free, I'll eat it however, you know. But, um, with the exception of hamburger, which, which you need to cook thoroughly, like, if it's a steak... Shit, I rare is is cooked enough, and in in blue rare, if I'm cooking it, I'm willing to risk blue rare for myself if I'm cooking it, and I should probably have a real chef do it just so I can taste it correctly. But, um, but it's certainly not thoroughly cooked, and there are plenty of people who do eat it blue, like beyond blue rare. Like there, uh, my dad used to be a chef. For a restaurant called T Bones, it's a it's a three star chain out of New Hampshire, and they're they're like a step or two above an Applebee's. Um, put them in like a in a last a less howdy do version of Texas Roadhouse with no peanuts. Um, but they're a three star restaurant. He was a saucier there, and um, you know the saucier when the chef is out, will will run the the brigade, will run the kitchen, and um. And, and the sous chef, of course, is usually the second in command. But 
he was being trained to, to go to school and he was actually only six weeks out when he had to um, when when there was an incident where he fell into a friolator and he's he, he's fine now he's fine now but there were many years of recovery but I'm not going to go into that whole story because that's kind of convoluted but um, he uh, he gets this order from the from the waiter and or the waitress and, and she comes up to him with this with this request and she's like um, this is what he wants are you even willing to do it and he looks at it and it says right on the pad it's because um, they had a charcoal grill in this particular T-bones and with all the proper ventilation and everything but it was it was a charcoal grill and so um, it, and the instruction was remove the grate from the grill throw the stick directly on the coals for 30 seconds flip it for 30 seconds and serve it up. And my old man's like, I'm not fucking doing this. I'll get my ass sued. And so he goes to his boss, you know, the manager was there, and, and he goes, Chef, I, I just, this is the request. And the chef is like, that drawer, grab a waiver. And he did. He grabs out a waiver and, um, the, he and the and the waiter waitress go out to the the guy and he says you know I am willing to cook your steak this way but I need you to sign a waiver because there's serious liability involved here and the guy's like yeah no problem he signs it and you know all how do you do and okay fine and sure as shit my old man goes in and throws the steak directly on the coals and waits the thirty seconds he's got a timer there right and because when you're when you're cooking like that precision matters and he was always very proud of how precisely he could cook his steaks and he's he's still to this day outstanding at cooking ste cooking steaks uh, unfortunately for him he he has to cook his well done because um because he has no teeth but um that's what phenobarbital will do to you but um and that's a that's a that's prescribed medication he wasn't on drugs or anything well he wasn't on illicit drugs um but the the steak he he brought it out and or the the waitress brought it out and delivered to him and said please give it a try and the guy cuts into the steak and he takes a piece and he sticks it in his mouth and chews it and swallows and he goes perfect and that was that and it's like well okay you know if if, if, if your stomach can handle it dude you know you do you and I think that that story is probably why I started experimenting with rarer and rarer steaks. And I like it rare, like like just the other just just the other side of the blue rare rare line, to where it's more, it's rare and not blue rare. And I have found what I believe is the perfect steak. Um, oh, but it's that it's those it's those ancient things within us like the appendix right that's where i was going with that the appendix is still in our bodies and it's still part of us and i, and I think that like if, if we can still get appendicitis right if our, if our appendixes can can eat us they've got to be doing something it's kind of like our liver our liver just like it processes toxins and the majority of us probably do more damage than we do good to our liver because most of us drink alcohol i know i certainly do um Oh, level 15 robot looter. Not that I'm fighting robots, but okay. Um, but it's these vestigial organs and these these, these ancient uh, circuits and triggers inside of our brains. Just really, really fascinating. And um, I've decided that because um, of all of the other things going on, I'm going to really kind of do more of a deep delve into, into psychology. And you know what that means? I get why Wayne philosophical because psychology and philosophy are very closely interconnected. You can't separate them. Philosophy is really the art of dealing with human psychology in a way that humans who don't necessarily have all the tools they need to understand the psychology can understand. That's that's I think that's a, a, a fundamental way of looking at it. And um, I'm I'm not a psychologist by far, although I have studied psychology at the collegiate level beyond intro to psychology. I studied abnormal psychology, which are your more extreme pathologies like psychopathy, sociopathy, um, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, um, 
to a certain extent autism although we're not entirely sure what causes autism to this day we don't we have no fucking clue what autism actually is we don't know if it's psychological or it's neurological or if it's both or if it's neither we don't we don't have a clue and i think that the the the, the big problem with that is is the fact that it is the brain is so complex i don't think that we've mapped and we've mapped quite a bit of the brain but i don't think we've really mapped still the majority of it we have no clue what underlies all the aspects of our brain and i actually saw a picture the other day that the real you is your brain in your nervous system which includes your eyes and so it was a picture of a brain with the two eyes and it was just the 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 tendrils of the neurons that travel through our body of the of the nervous system that goes through our body and it's like this is the real you which pilots a meat space suit and and i thought that was a really interesting way to put it and then that that's actually if from a from a fundamental level that's technically correct and so i thought you know that that's 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 kind of unique that's that's clever um but the, the philosophical structures and the psychological structures that we base our world on, I think that there's just so much to explore. And so I am going to continue deep diving into this exploration. And I, I'm i going to continue to do things like this. I think this is one of the things that I learned from Dr. Peterson's lecture series that was so fascinating, so important, is that his lectures were not meant to teach. They were meant to explore, right? So, like, when I lectured back at UTTC as a guest lecturer for the bank, I was teaching people how to do a, how to, um, how to do a skill, and that was budgeting, and that was dealing with credit. What, what Peterson did, and I think that's what a lot of this channel has turned into, is I'm exploring an idea that I don't know enough about, and so I'm letting my brain process it, and I'm, waiting, and I'm hoping that you'll all kind of engage in the commentary because I've been getting a lot of positive feedback, and although... You know, my views are kind of down. It's a hell of a lot less boring than me regurgitating more and more stuff about the game that every fucking YouTube creator does. And more power to them. That's their niche. That's what they're good at. But I think Entropia Universe has largely been fully explored from a gameplay perspective. And I think that by, by talking like the philosophy of being, and we can just kind of have a neat hybrid system going on here. So you, you, you let me know what you think. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time. So make sure you subscribe. And as always, I really appreciate the support, and we'll see you in the next one.